Oh, Bill, that was such a great part one episode with J.O. Collins. I mean, when he gets going, we cannot stop. So we let him talk because he is dropping all kinds of gems. We are so excited to hear about his new book, you know, all the stories he has in there. I, I just couldn't put it down. I was listening to the audio book and I couldn't put it down. So um, it was so great that we had to keep rolling. And guess what? We get to hear part two today. And I think that means he likes us. Yeah, I mean, I think he does. Uh, we really enjoy talking <laughs> to him. He has a voice that you cannot stop listening to. Calming, especially when the market drops, you just want to listen to him. So this week is part two of the Pathfinders episode. We hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Jackie, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your host. We're here to help you on your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting. We're going to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to FI together. Now, Jackie, in the investing section, there was a story with regards to how to identify the future millionaires of America that you really like. Can you tell us what, it was, what that was about? Yeah, I really love this one, JL. I'm a financial literacy advocate. I mean, I keep up with how many states are requiring personal finance in order to graduate. So I love the looking to young people and helping them out in their early days, as you do too, because obviously you wanted to teach your daughter. So yeah, so this, the one story is where is Gregory and Greg is in college. Now he had gone to community. He said he went to junior college or community school before he started college. And he was in this huge lecture hall and it was a, like a management, basic principles of management class, huge lecture hall. And the professor instructed them to go open up an IRA. Now he barely knew what that was, but he started with $200. He was a broke college kid. So that was a lot of money. And I think it was the second to the last day of class. And the professor asked the students to stand up that opened up an IRA and followed his instruction. And Greg thought that everyone would stand up with him. So he enthusiastically stands up. He looks around, there's only 10 <laughs> other people. I'm guessing there's 100, 150 students if it's a big lecture hall. And he was right. shocked that he was only one of a few that stood up. And the professor said, or asked the other students to give them a big hand because these are the future millionaires of America. And this, he went on to talk about the lesson of compound growth, which you talk about a lot in your book. But I guess little takeaways in the beginning that might not resonate with someone else, but the fact that he was in junior college before he right. even went to this college, he, he had the foresight to do that. And he was only one of a few that took the professor seriously he barely knew what he was doing, but he went and opened up an account. And I think he ended, he said that one, I called it like his little starting point, his little seed that he planted with $200. It ended up being over a million dollars. Now, not just that 200, but of course that was the seed he planted. Right. And I thought that was a really powerful story, but that was absolutely my favorite uh, in investing because you start young and the compound growth is just amazing. And it doesn't matter how small you start. It matters that you start and then you keep, keep adding. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 the simple path to wealth in some ways is one person taking you aside and giving you the one tip, saving in your retirement accounts that makes all the difference. We had Fritz Gilbert on earlier uh, this, this year and his boss took him aside in his first job and said, Max out your 401k. That's like four words. Right. <laughs> and he retired early based on that one statement and because he didn't know what he was doing. And it just takes that one person. And I didn't get that one person. I don't know why. So I ended up with my head in the sand. I ended up with lifestyle inflation. I ended up waking up late uh, because I didn't have the one person to say one sentence to me and then maybe follow up explanations to, and so we need to encourage our audience to tell their grandkids, to tell their kids that one thing that makes all the difference. And it could be read the simple path to wealth. That's it. <laughs> I hear from people all the time who tell me that they gift the simple path to wealth to their friends and relatives with that in mind. 
But not just a matter of those of us who are aware of this path sharing it, but people have to be open to hearing it. And so I do have this vision that I'm, I'm always gratified when people say, oh, I, I just bought 20 copies of The Simple Path to Wealth and gave them away at Christmas or whatever to my friends and relatives. And I, I think that's wonderful. But I also have this maybe cynical vision that there's now 20 copies sitting gathering dust on people's shelves where they say, oh, Jackie, thank you so much for this book. I can't wait to read it. And on the shelf it goes and it's forgotten. So, I mean, I hope that people hear the message. But unless they hear the message, then it's just not going to happen. So. Well, if you, if you make these steps, now we get into the fun part. If you take these initial steps of managing your debt, savings, and investing, you end up, not necessarily quickly, but pretty soon you end up with FU money. And tell me the difference, JL, between FU money and FI money. Well, so first of all, this is my way of thinking about it. So for a lot of people, they are synonymous. Being financially independent and having FU money is the same thing. In fact, that's probably the more common way to understand it. But I prefer to think of financial independence as when you have enough money that it supports your lifestyle and maybe a little bit extra. So you never actually have to trade your time and labor for money again to meet your bills and to do the things you want to do. For me, having a few money is that interim step on the journey. So it starts from the very first dollar that you save and invest is part of your FU money. And of course, as that grows, you become stronger financially and your ability to say FU when it needs to be said becomes stronger and your ability to make bolder decisions becomes stronger and your ability to live a, a more expansive and freer life with more options becomes stronger. So FU money for me is that interim step between where you start and where you suddenly look at the numbers and say, wow, I'm, I'm now financially independent and working is purely optional for me at this point. Yeah, there's somebody in your stories that uses a different term for FU money. They call it the shit hit the fan money or the shift money. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what's interesting here is people talk about health challenges. And in this story, they're very transparent about this person had an unanticipated manic episode and was diagnosed with bipolar one. His wife, not too long thereafter, in, in her 30s, was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. And then they talked about being on the path to phi and not quite Phi it gave them the freedom and time to focus on their recoveries without the additional stress that the need for money can cause. So they're managing to build wealth, but their FU money isn't just, I'm going to leave a toxic job. Theirs is that they can take care of themselves when they need to. And he talks also about the goal for him has never been to achieve Phi, but to achieve balance. You need to save and prepare for the uncertainty of tomorrow while enjoying the time that you have today. These are profound statements. And the writers in your book come up with just or have stories that are so prescient and important for all of us because we all run up against these things. Yeah, and they all have different life experiences, and they've thought about this stuff pretty deeply. The old saying, money doesn't buy happiness, is absolutely true. If you're an unhappy person without money, you're probably going to be an unhappy person with money. But that said, money is the single most powerful tool that we have to navigate this complex world that we've created. And therein lies the usefulness of money. If you're suddenly hit with some terrible disease, as you were describing in that story, that's going to be a struggle. And money isn't going to lessen the impact of the disease on your body. But not having to worry about money, not having that as part of the framework you have to deal with, being able to just focus on getting healthier, what a tremendous blessing handling your money correctly and effectively can be. 
I, how much more stressful is it if you're going through something traumatic like that and at the same time you're trying to figure out how to pay the bills because maybe you can't work anymore or maybe your spouse isn't working anymore. But it's money is security. It's like a suit of armor, as my friend Christy Shen likes to say. You can no longer actively earn income. And we'll have an episode on disability insurance and its importance and all the ins and outs of it in a later episode. Yeah, and JL, I, I just want to mention, I felt like the the people that share their stories, they were unbelievably vulnerable. They were very open and insightful. And that meant a lot. They weren't just saying, oh, here's how the simple path to wealth helped us, although it kind of did, and that's, that's the common thread. But a story like this, for example, very, very vulnerable. And I think that's what kind of sucks you in a little bit to make them really seem like real people. And part of that is probably because they trusted you and, and they felt like they knew you already and, and all the work that you've done. And so it was just great to have them just speak so openly about their, their situation, their story, and willing to share it with us. So. Yeah, it was. And from my point of view, it was, and from Chris, my editor's point of view, it was a real honor for us to to be able to read these stories and, and go through them and, and hear these perspectives from people. As I said earlier in this conversation, when I put out the call asking, we didn't know what kind of response we would get. We didn't know how many we would, if we'd get enough, we didn't know how many we'd get. We also didn't know whether the quality of them would be there, whether they would be compelling stories or not. We just didn't know. And turns out we got more than enough and they were, at least in my opinion, and it sounds like you both have the same, they, they were extraordinarily compelling stories and incredibly diverse. I mean, in terms of the subject matter, in terms of the people, in terms of the stage of the life they're in, the place in the world they're in. And yeah. So again, and my favorite part about it is that it is such a powerful pushback to the idea that, oh, this can only be done by a certain elite group of people out there. It couldn't possibly be done by me. This is just not true. It can be done by anybody listening to this. Yeah, I mean, let's go back to Jackie's story, right? She started from very humble beginnings, lived life in poverty to start, got a late start at around 39, and was financially free at 49 and retired. I think she's busier than ever, but she retired. <laughs> Is that that do that to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, go back yeah. to her episode and listen to her story. I mean, yeah. it's a powerful message that really anybody can do it once they wake up. And But the hard part when you get doing is staying the course, right? It's You have a great quote from Yuval Noah Harari uh, in Sapiens, mm. uh, where money is more open-minded than language, state laws, cultural codes, religious beliefs, and social habits. Money is the only trust system created by humans that can bridge almost any cultural gap and does not discriminate on the basis of religion, gender, race, age, or sexual orientation. Now, you put this quote in Staying the Course, and why did you do that? So, first of all, I love the book Sapiens, and I love that quote because there is so much nonsense, at least in the United States, that is put out around money and accumulating money that's so incredibly negative. This whole idea that money is the root of all evil which, by the way, is not the accurate quote, that the love of money is the root of all evil is the correct way of saying that. But there's just so much nonsense about this. And that anybody who's wealthy must have done something nefarious to become wealthy. And money's dirty. And it's all this nonsense. And I think Harari's quote there is so profound. In fact, I, I'd actually ask you to read it again because it's it might be the most profound thing in the book. Well, I'm happy to. I mean, because it's, it's it, we'll leave it in the show notes too so people can read it or they'll just need to read your book. But well, let's, let's do it because as yeah. you say, it is important. Money is more open-minded than language, state laws, cultural codes, religious beliefs, and social habits. 
money is the only trust system created by humans that can bridge almost any cultural gap and does not discriminate on the basis of religion, gender, race, age, or sexual orientation. And he, you go on to say that there was actually a story with regards to ISIS that proved right. this point. Maybe you, if you recall, maybe you can tell that story. Sure. So, and, and actually, this is Harari, who's the author of Sapiens, is recounting the story. But he, he talks about myths, right? Humans create myths. Then money is a myth. Now, myth doesn't mean what people think it means. It doesn't mean that it's not true and powerful and useful. But it, it is something that we all collectively decide to believe for whatever reason. Money, let's be honest, doesn't have any intrinsic value unless we all happen to believe that it does. But he talks about ISIS, and of course, ISIS viewed the United States as a great Satan. And at one point during the war, they conquered a city, I forget which one, and they broke into the bank and they found, I think, a hundred million or a couple hundred million dollars in cash in that bank that were in bricks of hundred dollar bills, United States currency. So here's this radical religious group who views the United States as the great Satan. They come across these pieces of paper that are printed by the great Satan with slogans about the political system of the great Satan and even religious quotes in there that are different from their religion. So, of course, as Harari says, they burn these things. Well, no, they didn't burn them because they recognize the value of money. They recognize that these pieces of paper from the great Satan covered with these things that were an absolute anathema to their belief system was more powerful than their belief system, or at least they were willing to set their belief system aside to enjoy the benefit of having these pieces of paper. That's incredible. That's one of the reasons I say that money is the most powerful tool that we humans have created to navigate this complex world we've created. Absolutely. Now, Jackie, your favorite story in the book comes in this part of, of the section of the book. Can uh, you relate this story to us? Because it's also near and dear to my heart. Yeah, this was awesome. It was Tom, and I believe that's a friend of yours, Jail. I did not know that when I listened to it. And This is also my favorite story, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So just to go on record. So you, I was wondering which story it was going to be. So That was uh, my all-time favorite out of the book. I'd love to meet Tom, I believe, is up in Michigan. I'm in Ohio, so he's not even that far. It would definitely right. be worth the drive to go visit him sometime. But so Tom, he has his ups and downs. He gets married young. He has, I believe, two kids, and he ends up getting a divorce. It sounds like he's an executive or a director-level person that changed right. jobs a lot. And... With each job, he got a raise, he got laid off some. So he had a series of good luck and bad luck. His mom and dad dies within a short span of time. And then his wife asks him for a divorce. He gets divorced from this wife. Then he gets married again to a new wife that's uh, 23 years younger than him. So he's all virile <laughs> and ready to go. And he has another child and things are, are going great. He changes jobs a lot, moving his family around and things yeah. like that. that. That's something that stuck out to me. And then I'm not sure how long he was married to the second wife, but he ends up divorcing her. And he's hopping from job to job, must be pretty successful because he's able to at least get jobs. And then towards the end with the second divorce, they split the, the money, the retirement accounts and things like that. And he ends up struggling financially. And by the time he hits like 61, almost like the job merry-go-round kind of slowed down because he thought no one wanted someone that old, even though he'd been doing his career for quite some time. And so... He ended up being uh, financially strapped to where he got to the point where he had to file for bankruptcy. And he's in his 60s. And he, he ends up taking uh, Social Security at 62 a little bit early. So it was a little bit less. But I remember the math where he 
was bringing in his money from Social Security, a tiny pension, I think something else, like when he was in the military, but it was about $2,500 a month. And I believe he was working on a farm, just doing some part-time work. So he's living on very little, but he's still super happy. He meets a, a Swedish girl, I believe. So I thought that was cute. I meet the Swedish girl and he's just super happy. And I guess for me, I didn't know how the story was going to end. And I was a little surprised and I wanted more jail. I felt like I was watching a movie. <laughs> and that's when, when I, at the very end, it said, this is part of an essay from the Dale Collins NH website. So of course I'm hurrying up and I'm going to the website. I want to read updates on the story. And so I got a little more there or whatever, but it was just fascinating to see that Throughout his life with ups and downs, you can call it good luck, bad luck or whatever. But in the end, his happiness, it really wasn't tied to the money. And he's apparently he's a, still a super happy guy now. And it was just kind of cool that he was so open to the ups and downs. But at the end, he, he didn't necessarily have some, oh, now I'm a millionaire or billionaire or anything like that. It was just his happiness. So that one was worn my heart. And I extended that out, of course, by going to the website and digging a little bit more about Tom. But Tom, I loved your story. So I, I as I said, it, it's my favorite. Tom, actually, he's a friend of mine. He used to be a client of mine which back in the 90s, which is how I got to know him. He was, as you alluded to, a very successful, upwardly mobile executive in the, in the advertising world. And, uh, but he went through a couple of very expensive divorces and he wasn't a saver investor and everything financially went wrong for Tom. He went bankrupt. He lost his house to foreclosure. He, he didn't have any assets. I mean, he lost everything at the age of 60, 61. And as you alluded to, I mean, Tom took his social security early because he needed it to make ends meet. That's not optimal financial decision-making, but you do what you need to do. He had that little pension. He has, he works on, on, uh, the Henry Ford museum. They have a, a farm from the 1800s you know, that operates the way they operate in the 1800s. And he's one of the guys that dresses in period clothes and tells people how it was done, but they actually work the farm. So he's out getting fresh air and exercise, and Tom's a few years older than I am, so he's in his 70s now. But what's what I love about that story, first of all, I love Tom uh, just as a friend, but what I love about that story is here's a guy where everything financial went wrong. And that's actually the title of the case study in the blog. This is one of the case studies that made it from the blog into the book. Uh, everything went wrong. And and yet Tom is probably the single happiest person I have ever met in my life and continues to be. And it's in, I think one of the things that concerns me in the FI community is I meet so many people who worry so much about their money. And I'm talking about people now who have a million, two million, five million dollars. And they worry about it all, all the time. I mean, is 4% the right withdrawal rate? Should it be 3.72% or, or something lower? And who knows what the future holds? And, and these are people who are doing extraordinarily well. And there's an argument to be made that maybe one of the reasons they're doing well is they worry about these things. They think about these things. I know that's probably one of the reasons that I was successful. I worried. I think I worried way too much. I think a lot of people in this community worry way too much. And the point is that with the right attitude, and Tom has certainly got the right attitude, your happiness is not tied to your money. I'm sure Tom would have preferred not to go through all those financial hardships. And if he and I had been talking about this stuff in the 90s, maybe that would have helped. But the point is, if you're on this journey, you probably don't need to have to worry as much as you are. Uh, almost by definition, you're doing the right things and, and you're going to be fine. Yeah, I, I think that's the part that resonated with me the most because as someone that's like four years post retiring from a corporate job, uh, you think about what about your mindset has changed. 
And my big takeaway after four years is that precision is not required. I did pay attention to so many things and stressed about so many things that now yeah. I'm like, why did I? Maybe because I'm on the other side of it, but I just love Tom's attitude. And I'm kind of of the same attitude at this point. I've done the, the big things right. And just precision is not required because yeah, fire people do obsess over withdrawal rates, sequence of, and all those things are important, but maybe not as quite as important as just being happy, enjoying the journey and, and just your attitude and who you surround yourself with and what kind of energy you throw off, you know? Well, if, if you, if you want me to offline, I'll, I'll, tell you how to get a hold of Tom and okay. maybe you can go up there and, and, and visit him on the farm. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to go to that Ford Museum. Uh, I definitely heard about it. And so now it's definitely on my bucket list. So yeah, I'm going to take you up on that. A actually kind of a funny story. We have a place in Wisconsin and my neighbor there, I want to say this was last year. My neighbor is a guy named Al who's a Wisconsin farm boy. He grew up on, on a farm in Wisconsin and he came back from, from a trip and he, he and I were talking, he was telling me about going to this Henry Ford Museum. He, he said, they have this really cool 1800s farm that's operating, and they have people that are actually doing the farming, and they're in the period costumes, and they tell you how things used to be done in the 1800s on the farm. And, of course, being a farm boy, he loved that. He said, man, there was this one guy I was talking to, and he was just awesome. He's a guy named Tom. And I said, Small do you world. mean Tom? And I mentioned Tom's last name, and, and he said, yeah, I said, that's my buddy. I know Tom. How <laughs> funny is that? Small, small world. Small world, yeah. Well, the, you know, there's a couple of stories that are tandem and back-to-back -back in this section, which are some of the more profound stories in the book, where you have one from a 30-year-old in the Ukraine, a country mm. at war, where he has a hard time finding equivalent investment vehicles compared to the U.S. And he, his home country bias with invest, investments in the Ukraine get frozen at the time of the war, but he had the foresight to have an international brokerage account with money in it for retirement outside of his home bias for geographic protection because we don't think of the confiscation or freezing of our assets in the United States. These are just not things we really think about. And then right after the story, you talk about, or a man from Russia gets a hold of you, and uh, he talks about the same thing. His assets all get frozen, and he has no control. But luckily, he still has a job. What did you feel, or what did you, when you got these stories, and at this time when there's, in their part of the world, war crisis? I, and Jackie alluded to those two stories earlier in the conversation, and I think in some ways th those are the two most profound stories in the book. And in fact, I was so impressed with them that at the beginning of this year, of 2023, I want to say in January when the stories were coming in and we were sorting through them, maybe it was 2022, but anyway... I actually put both those stories up separately as blog posts because I just thought they were incredible. Here's a guy whose country has been invaded and he is still finding a way to walk the simple path. Here's a guy whose country has become an international pariah and laden with sanctions, sanctions because they have invaded their neighbor. He's still figuring out a way to, to do it. And I contrast that to some of the people that I meet in the United States who say things like, well, oh, yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to be financially independent, but I need to, to have those least luxury cars in the driveway. So it's really not achievable for me. Like, well, OK, I mean, you can spend your money however you want to spend it. You make whatever choice you want to make. But you can't tell me that you can't do it when I see people like this who are doing it. Roman, by the way, who's the Ukrainian guy, has a podcast in Ukraine that I've been on. He's had me as a guest, and anybody who's interested in that can go to my blog, find the page at the top called Interviews, and go down, and you'll, you, can, you can scroll through all the interviews I've done. This one will be up on it when you release it. 
as are the first two that we did together. But anyway, if everybody's interested, they can go listen to that. But so not only is Roman doing this, but evidently there are enough Ukrainians doing it that he has a podcast catering to them. <laughs> so it's just, this is a country that's being bombed. It's been invaded. It's just so... That's, again, what I love about Pathfinders. You can't read Pathfinders and honestly ever say again that you can't do this. Well, um, I mean, humans are intimately adaptable. Yeah. I mean, our survival instincts kick in, and we adapt to the situations we are in yeah. with the eye on the prize, the eye on the horizon, the eye on the goals we have. And it's like, okay, I've hit a brick wall here. Let's find a way around it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I just, incidentally, I just listened to that podcast. It was awesome. Maybe we can uh, link that in the show notes, Bill. Oh, that'd be even better. Yeah, just just from their perspective, if anything, my mind got a little bit bigger from an international perspective, listening to the Ukrainian, the Russian, and then there were several other countries represented. So more than anything, it'll help you be a little more global in how you think about money and and reaching financial independence. So there's a lot of value there globally, too. And I think you realize, and I'm assuming most of your audience is Americans, And you realize the tremendous advantages that we have as Americans to pursue this. It's being pursued by people all over the world in some of the worst circumstances, like they're at war. But so if you're in the the United States, I mean, there's really no excuse. Yeah, first world problems, right? (laughs) First world, yeah, right. I mean, and, and again, if driving the luxury cars are more important to you, hey, it's your money. But at least now this is an option and that it can be done. Well, we're coming to the last few sections of the book, and you included one here in part eight on family. That's not something that we talk much about in the FI community. And why did you include this chapter and how did it become so important? Well, so first of all, I I had to talk about how the chapters themselves came into being. Chris and I didn't have the framework of the book laid out when we solicited the stories. The stories dictated the framework of the book. So as you mentioned, there are nine sections, and the stories themselves, as we went through them, sort of created, not sort of, they absolutely created each of those nine sections because of the content of the stories. So we didn't have the nine sections in mind and then fit the stories into them. The stories, the sections grew out of the stories themselves. Now, clearly, as you read through the book, I think you would both agree, you can read a story in lifestyle inflation and say, oh, that could equally be in freedom. So there were times where stories could be in two, three, maybe even four different sections, and we had to make a judgment call as to where to put them. But that's how all of those those chapters evolved. So... I didn't set out saying, I want to have a chapter on family. The contributors of the stories led us to say, oh, well, there are stories here that speak to the challenges and opportunities around family and following this path. Okay, so I did wonder about that. So you gave just a broad prompt of stories and people got to choose, oh, I want to tell this little snippet or I want to tell that little snippet. And that allowed you to, and then you guys, and Chris, he, he's the person at your publishing house. How, how did you even get with him to begin with, by the way? Well, he's at Harriman House. And so Harriman House reached out to me in the fall of, it must have been 2021, thinking about it now. And that was, they had seen, I'd put up a, a in the spring of that year, I'd put up a blog post asking for help on my second book which is how I lost money in real estate before it was fashionable. And they reached out saying, hey, we'd love to participate in this book. But the book was a week away from being published. And so at that point, that book was done. But I responded to this woman, Sally Tinker at Harriman House. And in that process, at one point, she whistled in Chris Parker who turned out to be my editor. And uh, because she's, uh, Sally's role is kind of 
basically finding authors that they want to publish. And I was so impressed with Chris. So this is all going over the course of two or three months before we finally linked to deal. But I was so impressed with Chris that when we put the deal together, I insisted that one of the clauses be that he be the person that I work with on this book. Because I didn't want to sign this contract and then say, oh, okay, Chris has got other things to do. Here's Charlie, who I don't know, right? right? I want to... And by the way, I didn't have to do that, as it turns out. It was always their intention to have Chris work on it, and he wanted to work on it. He's a huge, passionate fa- follower of The Simple Path to Wealth, and he really loved this concept and, and loved the book. And uh, yeah, he did a lot of the heavy lifting. He's it was just a great partner, and I can't say enough about him. So, as an Airman House in general was wonderful to work with. So that's the, that's the origin story there. Yeah, sorry for the sidebar, but yeah, it was great to, you kept mentioning Chris, and it seemed like they were such a perfect partner for you, and they were as just invested as you were, and obviously readers of The Simple Path to Wealth and things like that. So that's kind of cool. I always wonder how books come together, sort of the behind the scenes. So having that support from the right people, the right publisher, to me, makes a huge difference. So, So thank you for that. Chris also, by the way, is the one who did the cover design and I love oh. the cover of this book. <laughs> so yeah. he's an ed- you know, editor I, and he's uh, an yeah. artist. Well, I, I think it was, I think they have artists that physically did the artwork, but I think it's Chris was the guy who had the concept. Okay. Right? Gotcha. So gotcha. he was the one and, yeah. and, and we worked on it together, but mostly it was a matter of, Chris saying, what do you think about this? And me saying, I think that's awesome. <laughs> Let's do that. Oh, right? that's so, awesome. yeah, so he really, and then, as they say, they had artists that I think who actually rendered the illustration. Of, okay, of so the, he had the concept and then they his, brought his concept to life. Your exactly. Con- concept. Excellent, exactly. excellent. Okay, exactly. I love that. So we, we're in the know now. We're in the know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're in the know, but yeah, it was just a good, wonderful partnership. And Chris and I have become personal friends uh, since, so we still chat on a regular basis. And and he's just a he's a great guy, and yeah, and an well, extraordinarily talented talented fellow. Well, they're lucky they got you. That's for sure. So that's why I wondered how that partnership came about. So well, I f- I feel lucky that that to work with them. So. Yeah, I can honestly say Pathfinders wouldn't exist if it wasn't for those guys, because I don't think I would have had the heart to do it on my own after the, because it's so much work self-publishing. So, yeah. Um, We're coming to the end of our show. The conversation could go on forever, but Section 9 is interesting to me. I haven't reached Endgame. I look forward to Endgame. And what do you mean by that? And how do you know when you're there? Well, endgame is when you've achieved financial independence. And how is it, you're there is a pretty simple financial formula, at least the way I think about it. So there's this thing called the 4% rule. I hate the fact that it's called a rule, but it's a wonderful guideline. Evidently, it was created by a financial, or the concept was originated with a financial planner in the early 90s. But then maybe even more importantly, in the mid-90s, I want to say, there were three professors at Trinity University who ran a study looking at different asset allocations and different withdrawal rates and the impact of that over a 30-year time horizon. And... uh, When you distilled all of that out, if you were withdrawing 4% a year, adjusting for inflation every year, you had a 96% chance of your money lasting for 30 years. And that's, I think, where the common use of this 4% idea came from. There's a lot of ink has been spilt over whether 4% is the right number. And I don't care to get into that debate because I don't see it as a rule. I think it's a wonderful guideline. So if you're at a point where 4% of your invested assets can cover your expenses, you're financially independent. 
So the math on that is pretty simple. If you have a million dollars, 4% of that a year is going to be $40,000. If $40,000 a year covers all of your expenses and maybe a little extra, you're financially independent. Or you can look at it from the other direction. You can say, I need $40,000 a year. Well, if you multiply whatever that number you need is by 25, you get the number of invested assets you need. So you multiply 40,000 by 25, that's a million dollars. So that's my guideline. If those numbers work in your world, you can call yourself financially independent. So how does it feel when you get there? Well, in my case, because I had no concept of financial independence at the time, I was wandering in the wilderness. This would have been the late 80s, 89, 90, 91. I had FU money, and so periodically I would take sabbaticals from working. And the longest I ever took was five years, which was in that particular period of time, from 89 to 95. And at the same time, my wife decided to go back to school, so she quit her job. And, oh, our daughter was born in 1992. So every year, and I used to do this with a pen and paper, I would look at our expenses for the year, and I would look at our assets, and I'd kind of see where we stood. And we hadn't changed our lifestyle at all, but we didn't have any income. And I suddenly noticed that something remarkable, and that was that we had paid all our bills. We'd led pretty much the same life we'd always led. And there was more money at the end of the year than when we started. And I thought, well, that's pretty remarkable. And so then I went back and I looked at the year before, and I saw the same thing. Somehow I hadn't noticed it the year before. And I went and I looked at the year before that, and it was the same thing. Well, I knew something remarkable had happened, but, and this is embarrassing to admit, I didn't have the frame of reference to put two and two together and, and realize that, oh, this means you'd never have to go back to work again, right? Because I just didn't have that, that concept. So to me, it was, oh, this is interesting. And I put it away and went on with my life. And I continued my career for 2011, but I enjoyed my work. But it just never... It, being retiring early was never a goal of mine, particularly. I wasn't aware of it as a concept. I wasn't even aware of financial independence as a concept. I just knew I wanted to have a few money so I could take these sabbaticals whenever I wanted to. So any, that's what it felt like to me. Uh, I think for other people, it runs the gamut from doing the happy dance to, oh my goodness, what do I do now? And in talking to people at Chautauqua, which were the annual events I used to run. And I'd have one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. Frequently, people would come to me with their numbers. And these are all very bright people who can do the simple math. And they would lay them in front of me and they would ask, am I financially independent? And I remember one woman who was a, a banker. In fact, she was going to take a job at the end of Chautauqua that was going to pay her a million dollars a year. And she lays out her numbers for me, and she has $5 million invested. I said, okay, Val, that's great. Now, the, the other part of the equation is how much are you spending? And she, now this woman's a banker. I mean, exceedingly bright woman, as you can imagine, with the position she's going to. And she said, well, I'm living on $100,000 a year. I'm spending $100,000 a year. I said, well, okay. So... If we take 100,000 and we multiply it by 25, and she knows these formulas because she's run my book, we multiply it by 25, what do we get? We get $2.5 million. I said, and how much do you have again? I have $5 million. I said, Val, you, 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 you are financially independent twice over based on what you're spending. So if you're going to take this new job on Monday because you want the challenge or you love the work or... Whatever reason like that, then by all means, go do it. If you're going to take this job because you think you need the money, then no, you don't, you don't need the money. So why does somebody like Val ask me this question? And, and she was not alone. There were many people asked this question. And 
the conclusion I came to finally, because all these people again are very bright, they can do the basic math, was that compounding is a hockey stick, right? For a long time, it's the rise is so gradual, nothing seems to happen, and then all of a sudden it spikes. And Val and the others could read the numbers as well as I could, but they couldn't quite believe what they were seeing because it just feels miraculous the way it comes on. And they just wanted somebody else, in this case to me, to say they want to point it and, and say, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I mean, I know what I'm seeing, but I can't quite believe what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing I'm seeing? And then I'd be like, yeah. I mean, I'm seeing somebody who's financially independent twice over. Wow. <laughs> you know? and Is that I'm what you're just, seeing? Look, I'm just bummed that I didn't know about the Chautauquas early enough. I started hearing about them maybe around... 2019, and then the last one was 2022, yeah. and I, I was just at my peak, and I have since read about them, and I just hate that I never got a chance to go to a Chautauqua, and I don't know, maybe somewhere down the road we could like revamp that, but those were so <laughs> amazing, and the story about the banker, oh my God, like that blows they, my mind. Yeah, they were really amazing experiences, and I, uh, I, I'm not doing them anymore for a variety of reasons. And and I, I'm, it's the right decision, but I'm, but it's a decision that breaks my heart because we took part of the magic of Chautauqua is we took a very limited number of people, so we only took thirty people. And we'd have four speakers from the FI community. I was always one of them. And we'd spend a week together in some really cool part of the world in a really cool venue. And it, it was just a tremendous bonding experience. And the most remarkable thing about it was that virtually every attendee, and I asked virtually every attendee over the years, what's the most powerful part of this? What was your favorite part of it? And of course, I was always hoping one of them would say, oh, it was meeting you. <laughs> oh, it was your talk. Nobody. That would have been my was, answer. <laughs> yeah, no, it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't uh -oh. have been. No, it was never anybody's answer. The answer everybody gave was, I got to hang out with people who get it. We all are unicorns in the world we live in. And that's hard because nobody quite understands this path that you're walking on. A lot of people are made very uncomfortable by it, are actively hostile towards it, that are friends and, and relatives. And you come to Chautauqua and suddenly you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to explain what pursuing FI is or what the simple path to wealth is. Everybody there gets it. And so you can begin bonding with people and having conversations with people who are, light, who are very different than you because it's an incredibly diverse group of people, but who have this one cool thing in common that they all share. And, and in fact, Chautauqua was, one, was where I really realized that this concept that financial independence is only for software engineers with advanced degrees was just nonsense because... The range of people who came to Chautauqua was, I mean, any kind of human diversity you can think of was represented at Chautauqua. They had this one commonality, and that just brought everybody together. And incredible friendships came out of it. People started businesses out of it. I know of one baby that was conceived there. <laughs> I, I know of a couple of people who met their life partners there. Wow. Yeah, so, you cannot deny the value of community. And, and you're right. Yeah. I, I probably would have found that to be the most valuable thing. So oh, I get it. Yeah. Right. And you would have said, Jay, I was all right having him along. But that that wasn't the cool part. Well, one of my bucket list items is to meet you, JL, at some point. We've come close and we'll, we'll just have to make that happen. I have to say that having you again on the show has been a joy. We love talking with you and hearing the stories, sharing the stories. I think this book, Pathfinders, as you said, is a precursor to the simple path to wealth. So, you know, begin with the end in mind. 
find out uh, where your tribe is, who your people are, and which stories resonate with you, and then get the mechanics and the math as to how to travel down the path. Uh, do you have any final thoughts today for our late starter audience with regards to pathfinders? Well, for for late starters, I think we touched on this in the conversation. It's never too late. And it's not an on-off switch. So even if you only have a five-year time horizon, it's worth beginning the journey because you, you get stronger moment by moment. And you can be amazed, as the story of Val hopefully illustrates, that it seems like the progress is very slow. But but compounding is an amazing thing. And, and when it clicks, it's, it's a little bit stunning. Okay. Well, we look forward to having you again on the show and talk about your next book. I don't know if that's in the works or not, but uh, you're very prolific and we're very appreciative of the generosity you've had in sharing time with us on Catching Up to Five. Jackie, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm looking forward to the uh, next book, which I know it's a lot of work, but I feel like it should be something like The Lost Letters or The Lost Stories or something like that, the things that end up on the editing floor. But so, yeah, and I, I, JL, you might have uh, mentioned this sometime during our conversation, but how people learn is important. Like some people might not be the book reading type. I am not the book reading type, but I absolutely love listening to podcasts and the audio book was outstanding. Like the content is undeniably valuable. So if you don't want to pick up the book, you can go to Audible, get it through your library or whatever, and get the audio version. And of course, I left that five-star review. I left it on Audible. I left it on Amazon um, yeah. because I feel like the value that he, you have given to the Fi community is almost immeasurable. So if we just continue to support what you're doing, maybe there will be a book somewhere down the line, five, 10 years from now, who knows? But that type of support, I'm hoping that kind of keeps your light bright to say there are people that still want to listen to what I have to say and the ideas that I have to show love to this community. So. Well, and I, I appreciate that. And if anybody else reads Pathfinders or The Simple Path to Wealth and finds value in it and thinks that, that other people would benefit from it, Five-star reviews on Amazon are incredibly important because that's frankly how people who are new to it make their decision. And there are some people who like to leave low reviews. So the five-star reviews are, are incredibly important. If you, if you read it and it resonates and you think the message is important, then I think that you're certainly doing me a favor by doing that, but you're also doing the people who will maybe pick up the book because of your review a favor. Yeah. Well, again, this has been awesome. Uh, we hope that the stories have found a home with our audience. Uh, there's This is only a few of them, and uh, it really behooves our audience to read this book. But we also need five-star reviews. There's a couple of uh, calls to action we have here, but please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Send us a speak pipe where we get your voice messages and questions that we could put on the show. And heck, buy us a coffee. Go to the support us button on our webpage and help us defray some of the costs of this podcast. We have to give credit to in our show to Diana Falk, our social media maven, Sarah von Sternberg, our show notes author, and Fritz Bussard, our editor. And most of all, we give thanks to JL Collins for being here with us today. Thanks, JL. We'll talk to you again soon. It's entirely my pleasure. I'm happy to come back anytime, book or no. Okay. All right. Take care. And we'll see you next time on Catching Up to Fi. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Fi. We would appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star review so that our message can reach others. While we are financial educators and I'm a financial professional that loves to teach, our content is for general education and information purposes only. We are not providing financial, legal, or tax advice. Always do your own research or consult a professional before making important decisions. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.